Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the internet. This is David with the Dove's Treasure Store. Uh, this is the V-Log, the syndicated radio show. Uh, this is segment two of my show today. All right, so picking up where we left off, um, let's start back into the um, description of the points that I wanted to <clears throat> make. First of all, oh, let me turn this down. All right, first of all, I believe that an understanding in anthropological studies is important because it's my most favorite thing to do. Um, so what exactly is anthropology? Well, anthropology is the study of all peoples in all places in all times around all of the world. So it's a very broad topic and a multi-layered topic of complexities. Now if you saw my first cultural anthropology session um, I think a month ago or so, it's way down there in my videos. I, I went off on different tangents so I'm trying to stay focused. Alright, I'm going to open up with um, a, another paper I wrote another paper that I wrote on my own. Now this study here, I was brought to um, doing this research on religious cultures uh, because you know religion and belief systems play a very important part uh, when it comes to uh, theology and cultures around the world. All right, so I'm gonna give you, I did an outline, here's the outline. I'm gonna give you an outline of what my paper is so you can see how I try to make a topic uh, for each paragraph and then stay on it, okay? So this paper outline is gonna be about the ultimate reality of Hinduism and Buddhism. Now, how did we go from globalization of the North American continent to all of a sudden the ultimate reality and supreme beings uh, or a higher authority of Hinduism and Buddhism. Well, that's because when we start to talk about other globalization in other continents, it's going to be important to have a fundamental understanding of theology in those cultures, okay? So, um, okay, this is an analytical uh, analysis of the eternal self. And basically, Basically, the, uh, we're going to go over in the first part of the paragraph is the physical, the religious rites, and the release of the soul in death. And I feel like uh, I might touch down on the metaphysical uh, part in the end of that paragraph, which is nirvana or the reincarnation part, part, process of Hinduism and Buddhism. Okay, so let's go ahead and discuss the first paragraph of this analytical paper. I'm going to read, I'm reading directly from what I wrote about seven months ago. All right, we are all condemned to be free. Uh, Jean-Paul would say that we have a choice and a responsibility is attached to that decision uh, of free will. He would agree that man's will is predetermined. Um, you could either say preordained to be an inherently bad person or preordained to have in, uh, uh, you know, non-malicious good intents. So saying this through anguish, uh, one speaks for all of mankind. And I feel like that is going to be uh, a big important part on religious rights. For the example I give, um, Johnny smokes, but it is, a, it is bad for the people or for Johnny to smoke. Um, <clears throat> but you should not smoke, but he continues to smoke. So our forlornness condemns us to be free. And this is his free will and decision to harm himself with a self-destructive act. So, um, it is a facticity that we are thrown into a world without explanation of our path and self. Uh, so, uh, this is going to bring us to the metaphysical realm of nirvana and reincarnation, eventually. Another reason why we cannot escape our responsibility of the choices we make is because of uncertainty. And unpredictability and, and uncertainty le does lead to, um, uh, I guess you could say, uh, psychotic episodes it makes people go crazy because when you can't predict what's going to happen in your life you get a feeling of uneasiness so we turn to our philosophical or theological belief systems and uncertainty and unpredictability is despair that's what it is so we are binded to these doctrines of free will now 
I'm gonna go into if you have studied Hinduism or well, it's not in Buddhism, but if you have studied Hinduism, you would know Atman is uh, the self's friend and the self's enemy at the same time. The way to start to think of uh, Brahman and Atman is like you have all these different shapes and size and different color pots, but there's like a rain cloud over these pots and all this different pots have the same water the same raindrops in the pots. So therefore, as a collectivism, it's the same water, but in all these different pots. Like, and that's a direct reference to all the people in the world. Like, if you want to look at it another way, is when a storm rains over the ocean and that fresh water goes into the ocean, where is that fresh water drop? it becomes a part of the ocean, a part of the salt water. So that's a way of starting to think of Atmon. All right, so continuing with Atmon being the self's friend and the self's enemy, I feel like it is an easy, it's easy to try and see the indestructible self as a conglomerate of other collective consciousnesses um, where all the souls are gathered when they're released. So that's a way you can think of it. Like the, the droplets of rainwater and all, and all the different size and color pots is the soul. Um, and the pure nothingness is a major doctrine in the uh, Buddhistic way of Nirvana because the actual literal definition of Nirvana is complete nothingness. So see, when you're comparing Western culture to Eastern philosophical culture, you got to understand that they view the eternal self and the afterlife completely different. Whereas like not even breaking it down between Christians and Mormons because they see heaven or eternal paradise completely different. But understanding that in Eastern philosophy, they, they see the eternal self as pure nothingness. Not like oblivion, but uh, pure nothingness in a conscious state. Whereas a lot of Americans see uh, the afterlife as a you either go to a bad place or a good place. And most of us, when people die, we, at, you know, at funeral cer uh, ceremonies, we say, oh, he's in a better place, even though we might know that person was a bad person. Okay, so, um, this is trying to understand the interconnectedness of globalization and the standardized enslavement that the New World Order wants to put on us because the whole point of globalization is a global standardization. But how can you mix uh, a culture that believes this way versus a culture that believes this way in, in the internal self? Like we're not even on politics. We're not even on um, a level of of, of recreation. We're on a level of the afterlife and the eternal self. So if there's that much difference, how can you standardize those two different, completely whole different belief systems? So that's why I'm trying to show you the collectedness of the interconnectedness of the mind and body. All right. It's almost like a synapseness of a hive mind. Uh, if you follow my game reviews you, and, and, and you follow what we do on Magic the Gathering and all the card games, I have just started doing, um, I have just started doing um, some Warhammer stuff and bringing the strategic tabletop games to, the, to uh, the website. I haven't done any videos yet. But um, if you do play Warhammer 40K, uh, and, and you've heard of the Tyranid race, you would know that all the little minions are connected to a higher hive mind, uh, super uh, destructive uh, war machine. Like, or you could think of it as the queen in the aliens movie talks to all their lower alien minions and they're all connected consciously together. So, or like a real life example is bees in a hive, you know, like, when you disturb a beehive and a bee stings you, uh, that pheromone makes the rest of the beehive uh, frenzy. Or like if you swat at a swarm of bees, why does it make the rest of the beehive go crazy? Well, that's because they're all interconnected. All right, so the theory of karma yoga has heavy emphasis on the detachment of consciousness regarding someone's actions. 
to do good without thinking about self-interest or personal rewards. Now, I used to, in the early days of my college studies, I used to think people were inherently bad. And now I don't, because uh, I've seen personal action to, to disprove otherwise. But the doctrine clearly defines it as an unselfish act. Okay, so this unself, so act unselfishly, basically, is what I'm trying to tell you. Don't, like, okay, it would be wrong to sit here and say that Mother Teresa uh, never showed one hint of selfish, selflessness in all her acts, uh, because we're all human beings, but she probably did uh, show that a lot more than us, or like, or some of us, you know, basically saying she probably acted unselfishly more than others in today's times. Um, or like Princess Diana. So don't do good to get something out of the action, but just do good and live a harmonious life. Uh, that's what this paper that I wrote today, because instead of just focusing on globalization's facts and all the stuff and all the news and all the documents I'm going to bring you, I wanted to bring you a philosophical topic about good things. And, and I didn't always want to be depressing and always down on deep topics. All right. So reincarnation allows me to see in Hinduism as a release into the next life. Um, you know, even in really, I've, I have a lot of friends that live in Nepal and they say that Buddhism is just a branch of Hindu, Hinduism uh, from Hinduistan. You know, other peoples want to disagree and say Hinduism is a part of um, its own its own religion or religious system, even though Hinduism and Buddhism don't really coexist that well together, and Buddhism is not really a religion, but I don't want to define that as a um, defining statement. Okay, so if reincarnated, then people would start to agree that this reincarnated person has unfinished duties or has wronged someone or something in, in a past life in which they are making up for. So that's a that's a good key point to understand in in Buddhism reincarnation is viewed as a good thing but in Hinduism reincarnation is viewed as kind of a bad thing or is really frowned upon um, it's not something that you in Hinduistan they they or Hinduism they have a saying let's not get reincarnated that's what that's what a lot of my um, friends over there tell me okay so my favorite example of these uh, can are, are three candles side by side. The first candle is lit. The second wick is lit by the first candle. Uh, the, is lit by the f first flame. Okay, we do this until the flame gets to the third candle. Uh, extinguish, extinguish the other flames, leaving only the third. Well, the flame on the third wick is essentially both original flames within this one flame. But where are the two original flames? So that breaks it back down to the the water, the fresh water in an ocean. Like I was saying, where's the fresh water droplet in the salt water in the ocean? So that's kind of another way of trying to understand it. So when a person has become awakened, they have been given insight of moksha. And moksha is the truth of knowledge, uh, or basically the higher understanding that I'm always trying to bring to you guys. Because basically, we want to reach moksha, but we don't hear that in American and Western uh, archetypes of culture. Because it's, it's just foreign to us. Alright, so... The Buddhistic doctrine of mind is fascinating to me because there is no self. Like another way of thinking of the Buddhistic doctrine of of self is, I think there was a famous uh, there was a famous emperor that had some court jekylls or court templars that were trying to make the emperor understand what removing self was and how he could best do it because it was a war emperor, a warmongering emperor was to use his chariot, his war chariot as the example of the self. Basically saying, saying emperor, if you were this war chariot 
and you're a whole complete part and we take apart the reins we take off the wheels we take off the spokes we take off the standing platform we take off the armor that protects the chariot where is the chariot if you disassemble all of the chariot there really is no chariot until all the pieces are together so that's kind of understanding it but we as Americans want to label everything and we want to categorize this and that so we also love our definitions our exact definitions and it does seem to most that we define our individual self and identify a mind a thinking mind with the self but you know if you were just born in like you know uh, let's say a, a farming a, a family farm where they they put two people together to breed and then they take the child like a hen from eggs and then they put the child in another place another camp how would that child get his identity of self uh, you, you don't just come across this identity of yourself without some guidance you you have to have guidance because that's like what going back to Descartes uh, I am I think therefore I am well if you never had that idea of self you you wouldn't be able to define this clearly that's why this is important so <clears throat> in the example of the monk and the king discussing the chariot as a self when the monk has stripped away every aspect that makes up the chariot there is nothing but the parts so this is also understanding another part of nirvana, complete nothingness. So the five, aggreg five aggregates uh, that segues into this example is the mind as a whole uh, of the five aggregates is nothingness once you begin stripping down the solid state. The theory of nirvana is nothingness. Once again, I keep repeating that so you remember the difference between nirvana and the incarnation. All right, this leads to the middle path that they try to stick to, stick to. Uh, basically, the right thinking, right mindfulness uh, is a path that leads to a compassionate intellectual individual. And it is a balanced way of life. Uh, I agree that people who harm others have suffered already as a victim somewhere in their life and are acting out that contempt. Okay? Because think about it. A person that is getting off on harming others or seeing others harmed is already a victim of some violent act or ne violent neglect. I mean, if you really honestly think about it, someone that gets off on something that sick, they, they, they've they suffered and endured something sick themselves. They're, they're a victim without, they're, they're, they're a victim in some way without even knowing it. So, this leads us to the Eightfold Path. And in my opinion, it does seem to shut off a lot of questions raised about the eternal life because well, wait, let's go to back. Let's backtrack. But at the same time, if I believed in this institution of thinking, I would feel that the thought process of what happens to me, my soul, myself, my mind, when I die or leave this plane of existence, that at least the whole notion of nirvana puts me at peace. So, the peace and nothingness, or I would receive a reincarnated path. So, I'm going to stop there on free will of and, and leading to the eternal self. I, just, I was just giving you that as, you know, daily thoughts today. Because I think it's interesting that we as a people understand your identity of self. It's very important, even to Christians and other modern Judeo beliefs. Okay, so, um, again... I guess we're going, I don't want to take a break. I just want to go straight through this break. And um, I'm going to skip to something. I'm going to go back to globalization. But I'm going to skip the American continent that we are on right now. And I want to go to parts of the Caribbean, okay? So you can still, we're still trying to understand. Excuse me, I, I've got, I, I wish I had a button to mute myself sometimes. I, I, I ate garbage, which is what is known as fast food. So that's why. I don't feel that great right now. All right, so the Caribbean is the American backyard, and that's why I think it's kind of important sometimes to understand that, 
because that's where we started with what that's where I've started you guys with is globalization on the American continent or in the North American continent and I think it's sometimes a lot of it's neglected in a lot of discussions and debates okay so the Caribbean has many factors that make the area a very distinct region and because the Caribbean are island societies their populations are cluster groups if you have some statistical uh, understanding or you've taken statistic classes you would understand cluster groups now, or especially a lot of sociologists understand cluster groups because you need to understand stuff like that to do a proper survey on a population okay so early and um, mid 19th century was a high highly egalitarian for these societies there would be less horticulture and agriculture within the mainland regions because of the poor soil poor soil due to the substance farming and underdeveloped governmental programs that initiated positive growth in the agricultural industry so that's why I think it's kind of important to understand that because a precursor to human survival is agriculture but before agriculture is horticulture look it up if you don't know what those are you need to you need to know that because it is a precursor to human survival and look it up is all I can say it, it, there's no debate in this there's no discussion in that it's just documented evidence there that proves that it is a precursor to human survival so again the Caribbean is the American backyard um, and the American government has set up puppet organizations and dictatorships to police this area and this is you know at the turn of the 19th century not necessarily right now I'm just trying to give you a little short history lesson in the globalization understanding process so this that is why American military wanted control of the Philippines and was because of economic trade ties to China it's it's a good it's a good economic trade tie close to China so that's why the Philippine the base there is important to us and a military as a military outpost that's that's what it is so this too goes for the same for the Caribbean to set up a perimeter and that's why when you understand that from a historical basis we've been doing this you know since the 1800s and and that's why history is a very important part in anthropology and anthropo and anthropological studies um, uh, so you, you can't really you can't really identify and, and make a proper analytical decision uh, on a paper like this without understanding your history you've got to understand it you've got to know your history all right so going back to demographic transitions like I was kind of introducing you to a general concept of demographic transition I'm, I'm still trying to stay here in the Caribbean for uh, a few more seconds all right the demographic collapse of the indigenous population of Latin America even though that's not really the Caribbean but it still gives you a fundamental idea of it is heavily weighed on the carrying capacity of the environment I mean that goes to say for any region so certainly agriculture practices are not sustainable are not a sustainable dynamic there but some other reasons where because some other reasons are because these populations relied on the outside aid or on ob or were they were obligated to operate a certain way uh, due to the region had an economic debt and and ties to outside forces so for example coffee is the second largest commodity exported around the globe now I mean anybody that's in importing and exporting knows this I mean that's interesting let's say that again coffee is the second largest economic let's go back Coffee is the second largest commodity exported around the world, okay? Around the globe, because we're, we're in globalization right now. So, for these indigenous populations, the rise in coffee consumption increased, but the actual amount of coffee exported was low. So, because outsourced markets, and there we go back to understanding that first general concept, outsourcing and modification, is it would be hard to keep on top because of outsourcing so um, that is going to wrap up the American backyard for now we might come back to that we not might not I'm trying to just stay on topic like I promised and um, in in doing so going back to what I said I wanted us to learn about if I can find it 
Um, oh yeah, okay. So I was trying to finish up with ethnicity and the human um, modification. And um, to understand human modification, you need to understand modern spatial and demographic patterns. Uh, because the total North American population is 340 million. Uh, United States is at 306.8 million. Canada is at 33.7 million. And this was about 2010 to 2011. So it's kind of important to know big numbers like that because it gives you a broader uh, spectrum. Uh, and it gives you a more important idea of where we're at on a population scale. So, uh, in, indigenous people occupied North America for 12,000 years, uh, and the Europeans arrived about 400 years ago. And the European diseases and disruptions reduced the Native American populations by 90% in some areas. Well, and there's a lot of other factors that played in the reduction of Native Americans' populations. So, I think that's important to understand that because even someone like my 80 year old father can still recognize that major wrongs occurred to the Native Americans. Okay, so uh, let's continue on the modification and inside of this, the population and settlement. All right, so we're gonna be in the part of occupying the land. In stage one, that was the 1600s to the 1750, uh, colonial footholds on the East Coast still were rampant and had a strong foothold there. Uh, but in the stage two of the demographic transition at this time was 1750 to, 1750 to 1850, infilling better Eastern farmland, Canadian settlement slowed at this time. Again, this is just a short history lesson to understand where our population has come from to where it is now. And stage three was 1850 to 1910, westward movement for gold rushes and other opportunities. I just write, I just write these topics down, these highlighted topics, uh, so it gives me a general idea from where to talk from to talk from if you're just wondering like why I'm going from like topic to topic like this. Because I feel like it's important to understand westward westward expansion. Um, because that's really what you know the pioneers that's where the the trailblazers came from um, and, and and understanding that that's the American dream that's the American way of life but uh, anyways by 1990 there have been more there more than half of the US population lived west of the Mississippi River and 2008 to 2009 saw out migration from the west because of economic downturn we already know that that's not something I need to know but that that's just a quick move from the 1800s to now uh, and trying to just understand a, a transition in the demographic model so um, I don't know where to go right now actually I, I have a, so many things on my mind I want to bring out the uh, I want to bring out something here um, from paleo, Paleolithic prescriptions for the diseases on civilization. And um, 